All right, welcome to our next video in the series. We're going to be doing the second video on recursion. I'd recommend watching the first video. We defined what recursion is. We talked about base cases and recursive cases. Oh my, uh, yep, base cases and recursive cases. And we showed one example of a recursive method called factorial. We're going to do a couple others today. We're going to talk about uh, exponents. And I'm going to show an example of a recursive method that uses strings. So for right now, I'm going to go ahead and minimize out my factorial method. And let's talk about uh, how we would handle um, printing out uh, exponents, right? So let's say I wanted 3 to the power of 2. That's 3 times 3, which is 9. Or 3 to the power of 3, which is 3 times 3 times 3. That's 27. Now normally, we can accomplish this task just by using math.pow, right? 3 comma 3. This should give me... Uh, a, a number, a double uh, answer, yeah, and then we're going to go ahead and print out answer, and that should look like 27 when I run this. Okay. Well, what if I wanted to make a method that did the same thing? It had a base, it had an exponent, but then um, we used recursion to solve the problem. So that's going to look a little something like this. So we're going to have recursive exponents powers. I'm going to say public static int, uh, I'll call this power, and I'll have a base, and I'll have an exponent, which I'll call exp. Um, and we're just going to put a little stub replace returner for right there. So we're going to ask ourselves the question, whenever we write a recursive method, what's the base case? What's the recursive case? Start with the base case and ask yourself, what's the simplest thing that can happen? Well, to me, the simplest thing that can happen is if I have an exponent that is zero, then I'm just going to return one, right? Anything to the zero of power is one. So I'm going to say if uh, the exponent is zero, then we're just going to go ahead and return one. If it's anything other than that, we're going to have to do something a little bit different. So for example, um, I would need to return, if I want to do... Uh, 2 to the 4th power, well, that's going to look a lot like 2 times 2 to the 3rd power. This is going to seem familiar from the last video. That's going to look like 2 times 2 times 2 to the 2nd power. And that'll be the same as 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 to the 1st power. And that, for the way I'm going to construct this, is going to look a lot like 2 times 2 times, whoops, that's the ampersand, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times, now check this one out, 2 to the 0th power, which is going to be 1, 2 to the 0th power. And all of this is going to get me eventually to the answer I want, right? 2 to the 2nd is 4, to the 3rd is 8, to the 4th should be 16. So... The reason I know this could be done recursively is because 2 to the 4th and 2 to the 3rd look like very similar problems. I just need to add, multiply by one more 2 to turn my 2 to the 3rd into a 2 to the 4th. So what does that look like? Well, let's return base times, and then now it's a very similar power problem. I'm going to use the same base, but my exponent should shrink by 1, right? If I want to know what 2 to the 4th power is, let's go ahead and go 2 times 2 to the 3rd power. So I'm going to say exponent minus 1, and this meets the criteria of making sure that our recursive method call continues to head the direction of the base case. By asking exponent to shrink every time this method is called, I'm going to get closer and closer to an exponent of 0. So we've got a base case, we've got a recursive case, Let's go ahead and fire this thing up and, and see if it works. So answer was math.pow. Let's try our method. So let's try power of, I'll say, 2 comma 4. See if we can get that 16. And I'll get rid of that. We no longer need this. All right, so we go ahead and run it. Boom, we get 16. Let's try another example. How about uh, 1 to the 15th? It's going to get messy, but it should just be 1. Very good. How about um, 8 to the 3rd should be 64 times 8, which is, in fact, 
512. Very good, very good. All right, so you can see we had uh, recursive methods that took one parameter. We can have recursive methods that take multiple parameters. Um, what if we wanted to do something not related with numbers? For example, what if I wanted to do recursive space remover? What does recursive space remover mean? Well, if I have the method uh, remove space and I pass it, um, uh, well, let's go with hello there, hello there, then it should return hello there, hello there, <coughs> with no spaces. So if I get a string that has spaces in it, we want to remove all those strings. So let's look at an example. Public, static, uh, we're gonna be returning strings here and I'm gonna call this space remover and uh, we'll call this string text, that'll be my input. And what's the base case, what's the recursive case? Well, the simplest thing that can happen for space remover is for there not to need to be any spaces that need to be removed. So if I say if text dot contains a space, well that's actually the opposite of what I want. I want to know if there's no space. If there's no space, well golly, we can just return the text. What matters is if there is space, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a little placeholder return value right there just to get this to compile. Well now I've got to figure out how to take that space out. Now I'm aware Java provides us a string class with many useful methods that would get rid of this, right? I think replace, replace all would get this done. I'm just trying to show an example of how we would approach this recursively, right? So we've got our base case here. We've got our recursive case here. Let's go ahead and figure out, um, I'm gonna call this space index. Where is that space? Hey text, what is the index of the space? So that tells me that's where it is. And then what I wanna do is I want text to become all the stuff that was before that space and all the stuff that was after that space and then uh, smush it together without that space. So I'm gonna say, hey text, uh, you are now everything, so a substring from zero up until the index of space plus text.substring of space index plus one. All right, so why did I do plus one? Because we know that the way substring works is when you provide either one input or two inputs, the first input um, does get included, but the second one does not. So when I used substring with two inputs here, I would include zero, which is good, we want the first character, but I would not get the space where it is. Now because I'm using the one parameter version of substring, then I wanna make sure I, when I get to the space, I skip to one past it, okay? And then when we're done, we can just return text. In fact, I, if we really wanted to be fancy, um, we could say return, uh, oh, now this is interesting. If I just say return text, notice how it will remove the first string or the first space but if there are multiple spaces, then it still does not get uh, fixed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say return space remover on text. And remember, we just updated text here. We pulled out the first piece of string, or the first space, and then we're gonna check. All right, send this thing back to space remover. If the new version that we send through has no spaces, then we should just get the text, we're good to go. But if there's more spaces, then we will go looking for the space again, we will trim out everything before the space, everything after the space, and then put it back through. Um, some people have seen this technique with a while loop before. While text dot contains a space, go ahead and pull that space out. I'm just showing you what the recursive equivalent would be. So let's go ahead and say uh, now, string answer is gonna be space remover of, uh, how about reluctantly crouched at the starting line 
a little tribute to a good cake song. And then we'll go and print out an answer. We'll see what we get. And sure enough, it just takes all the spaces out. And what this means is the space remover method gets called at least or it gets called once for every space that appears. So the first time it's called, it removes this out. Then it removes the second space, then the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And remember, the methods will resolve in that order. Re, uh, space remover of reluctantly crouched to the starting line has to call space remover of reluctantly crouched to the starting line with the first space removed. So that's, that's an example of what it looks like to, um, that's an example of what it looks like for a string input and output for a recursive method. So the last thing I wanna do is I wanna compare what would be the recursive version versus the non-recursive version for one of these methods that we've seen. So if I see factorial right here, this is the recursive way that I built factorial. I built in two test cases, uh, two base cases. Let's handle when n is zero. Let's handle when n is one. For everything else, we're gonna use this basic logic right here. Most people will point out that the introductory way that we teach recursion is not the best way to solve a problem. For example, if I wanted to have another static int, I'll call this fact two, or maybe um, I'll call it iter fact, because this is gonna be the iterative technique for factorial. We're gonna see that we can get this done uh, with far less complexity. So I'm gonna go ahead and shrink up factorial, and instead of using a recursive method, I'm just gonna use a good old fashioned for loop to accomplish this task. So I'm gonna say for int i equals n, i greater than zero, i minus minus, and we're gonna go ahead and prime our loop. I'm gonna say uh, int uh, factorial equals one, and when we're done, we are going to return factorial. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say, all right, whatever the number was, start the loop at that number, say it was five, and I'm gonna say, hey, factorial, factorial, multiply yourself by whatever the index of your loop is. If it's five, so first we'll start with one times five, it's five. Then I will decrease to four, so we multiply by four. Then I will decrease to three, and we will multiply by three, by two, by one, and so on. So I'm gonna go ahead and take out this code right here. We'll turn this back into a number, and I will ask for the iter fact of mm, seven. Let's do a nice, reasonably big number. We go ahead and print that out. We get 5,040. You know, it occurs to me I should have picked something I could verify. How about four? Yeah, 24, very good. So let's compare and contrast these two, right? Because you've got iter, iterative factorial and you've got recursive factorial. Now, you might admire the elegance and uniqueness of recursive factorial, but I think if you were working in industry and you were asked to solve this problem, often trying to do it the fancy way, in a way that is showy, um, it can, not always, but it can get you in trouble. And in the case of having to do multiple method calls, you might be taxing your computer, asking it to do more than you need it to do. Uh, I think the demands on your computer are far less for the iterative approach, uh, just using a good old-fashioned for loop like we started with. So this is uh, identical functions, right? Fact and iter fact do the same thing. Uh, fact is recursive. Iterative fact is iterative. It, it's called iterative because we know that when something iterates, it progresses to the next step. So the idea is that iterative is sequential, one at a time, in order, whereas recursive, you solve the same problem over and over, but you continue to scale down or change the set of data that you're working with in a way that allows you to break a problem down into a smallest, simplest case, like a base case. All right, so that was our next video on recursion. Thanks for watching.